Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dr. Aideen Hartney and I am the Director of the National Disability Authority. I'm delighted to welcome you to the launch of the NDA's new guidance for conducting collaborative research with disabled people. This new guidance is a practical resource to help researchers meaningfully involve people with disabilities throughout the research process. Before going on, I just want to point out a few Zoom features. If you require captioning, you can turn this on at the bottom of your screen using the CC button. The Irish Sign Language interpreters should be pinned to the screen, so you should be able to view them. We have disabled the chat function, but we would invite you to post any questions you might have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of these as we can during the panel discussion towards the end of the webinar. Just a reminder that this event is being recorded and after the event, we will email all the attendees with a link to the recording so you can share it with colleagues. The landscape in Ireland for meaningfully involving people with disabilities in research has changed substantially over the past few decades. For example, we now have funded initiatives such as the PPI Ignite Network, which supports researchers in higher education institutions and the public to collaborate in research. And many funders now require evidence of public involvement in grant applications. Ireland's ratification of the United Nations Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2018 is also important to note as meaningful involvement, equality and participation of disabled people are key principles of that treaty. If Ireland is to fulfil its obligations under the UNCRPD, disabled people must be involved in research and decision making in which they have a stake. Unfortunately, traditional research approaches are often poorly aligned with UNCRPD requirements. Collaborative research approaches, on the other hand, share similar underlying principles with the UNCRPD, and particularly in relation to those of involvement, equality and participation. This has resulted in collaborative research approaches not only becoming much more common, but also becoming the recommended approach to research. And as such, I'm delighted that the NDA now has an up-to-date practical resource to help researchers and organisations to meaningfully involve disabled people throughout the research process. Before I finish, I would like to point out that today's event is part of the annual PPI Ignite Network Festival. This festival, which will continue for the entire month of October, is a chance to celebrate and showcase the incredible progress that is being made around involving members of the public in Irish research, and the NDA are delighted to be a part of it this year. So the format for the rest of this webinar will be as follows. First, you will hear from Dr. Chloe Walsh, who will tell us about the new NDIA guidance. Then you will hear from three guest speakers, Anya Wellard, Fionn Crombie Angus, and Dr. Emer Morrissey, who are going to share their perspectives of being involved in collaborative approaches to research. Our colleague, Jane Clare, will then moderate the Q&A session where you will have a chance to send questions to the panel. So before I hand over, I just want to acknowledge the very hard work of Chloe Walsh on developing this guidance and all the support she has had from NDA colleagues, Jane Clare and Roz Tanning among them, but also everyone who works hard behind the scenes to bring our work out and to uh, organize web uh, webinars like today. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Chloe Walsh. Thank you, Aideen. Um, just wanna check with the colleagues in the background if my slides and everything are okay. Um, if you can see the ISL interpreter. This is Jane. Yes. Yeah, we can. I can see you and your sides and I can see the ISL interpreter there at the top of the screen also. OK, thank you very much. And thank you, Aideen. 
So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for attending our webinar today. My name is Chloe Walsh, and I'm going to introduce you to the NGA's new guidance for conducting collaborative research with disabled people. So this guidance is mainly aimed at researchers who want to meaningfully involve disabled people in their research, but it, is also, it can also be used as a reference for anyone who's interested in this topic. So to start off, I want to share some key statistics. So the census, the new census 2022 data showed that over a million people in Ireland report a disability. This is 22% of the population, and this is a significant minority of people who can contribute to research as researchers, as research participants, and as collaborative researchers. And today we're going to focus on the collaborative research element. So what do I mean by collaborative research? So collaborative research is research in which the people who are likely to be impacted by the research are directly involved in making decisions about and conducting the research. Some examples include public and patient involvement or PPI, inclusive research, participatory research, engaged research, and so on. So we are using collaborative research in this context as an umbrella term that can, and the aim is to provide information, information that could apply to any of these approaches. So there are various levels of involvement, um, some of which are outlined in this graphic uh, that you can see on the slide here, which is adapted from Health Research Charities Ireland and the Irish Health Research Forum. So the first level at the bottom is consult, and this refers to things like consultations and advisory groups. So in these instances, people have a very important role to play as they act in an advisory capacity, but they do not generally have much control over the research. The next level up is involve, um, and this is where some level of decision making is shared, um, but maybe not throughout the entire process, or maybe not in relation to all decisions. So there is some level of partnership here, but it's not a full partnership. Full partnership comes at the top two levels. So the second from the top refers to projects in which decision-making powers um, and control are shared equally between the community members and the researchers. And then finally, the top level is when refers to research in which the community members initiate and control all stages of the research. In some instances, they may be supported by academic or other researchers, but in all cases, the community members have full control over the research. So why did we develop this guidance? So I'm sure many people here will have heard of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or the UNCRPD. So this is an international convention which aims to realize the rights of disabled people. And one of the rights in that convention is the right to meaningful participation and engagement of disabled people in matters that affect them. This, um, this is set out early in the convention and is a cross-cutting obligation. It's important to emphasize that participation and engagement goes beyond merely consulting with people with disabilities, rather it incorporates principles of co-production and co-design of policy, effective monitoring of outcomes, and equal participation in research. In addition to the rights around meaningful involvement and engagement set out in the UNCRPD, the research landscape in Ireland has changed substantially over the past few decades, with much more of a focus on involving members of the public, including disabled people, in the research process. There are now lots of very good re resources available for involving members of the public in research, but there are fewer resources that focus specifically on involving disabled people that consider things like accessibility. So the NDA set out to fill that gap. So how did we develop this guidance? So we had input from a project advisory group throughout the entire project, which included representatives from disabled persons organizations. We conducted an extensive literature review, which is available on the NDA website. And we conducted a series of discussion groups with representatives of disabled persons organizations, disabled individuals, representatives of voluntary and community organizations and researchers. And we got feedback from various co contributors on drafts of the document. So why should we be engaging in collaborative research? So there are many reasons um, which are outlined in the literature, but also um, were outlined in conversations we had in the development of this guidance with uh, disabled people. So for example, taking a collaborative approach to research helps to ensure that research takes a rights-based perspective and is aligned with the UNCRPD and the social model of disability. It can help to inform policies and ensure they are relevant and meaningful to disabled people. It gives a voice to disabled people where they may not have had a voice before. And it can improve the research process. So for example, collaborative research can ensure that research topics and designs are authentic and relevant. 
It can help with accessing harder to reach groups. Co-researchers will often anticipate problems and solutions that the researchers may not have thought of. It can generate more authentic data and outputs, and it can help research go further because co-researchers may be willing to share the research with their communities and networks who may not have access to the research otherwise. It also promotes transparency over public spending. So research is often funded through public money or donations and including people, disabled people in the research process ensures that the people who are supposed to be benefiting from that funding have a say in how uh, the money is to be spent. Co-researchers can be involved in any stage of the research process. So for example, they can be involved in identifying and prioritizing research by deciding what research should be done and how. Involvement in commissioning research can be done in a variety of ways, such as including, uh, including co-researchers in reviewing research proposals. Co-researchers can get in a, involved in a variety of roles in designing, managing, undertaking, and disseminating research, such as contributing to ethics and funding applications, collecting data, analyzing results, writing up research reports, giving presentations of findings. And co-researchers can also be involved in the planning and implementing of evaluation, in, sorry, impact evaluation activities. Um, sorry, I should say as well, there is much more information on this um, in the guidance document as well. But I think it's also important to note the barriers that can prevent people with disabilities from getting involved in co-research activities. So again, these are barriers that are highlighted in the literature and were highlighted during our conversations um, with it within our discussion groups when developing this guidance. So uh, a major barrier is tokenism, and this happens when researchers want to appear to have meaningfully involved disabled people in their research, but have not done so meaningfully. It can also happen by accident when researchers don't know how to meaningfully involve disabled people. Ableist attitudes and policies can prevent involvement, for example, when researchers underestimate the abilities of co-researchers um, or when traditional policies uh, create accessibility issues. Inaccessible in environments, information and language can create substantial barriers for many disabled people, for example, not providing Irish sign language interpretation or not providing materials that can be that can be read by screen reader technology. Not paying co-researchers for their time and expertise is also a major barrier, and they, this can create substantial inequalities in the research team, because professional or academic researchers are often paid for their time. And again, there's general, there's more information about this um, and advice around it within the guidance. A lack of understanding among caregivers and supporters around the collaborative research process or around the motivations of researchers can also understandably create feelings of weariness around collaborative research among caregivers and supporters. So it's very important for researchers to be as transparent and as communicative as possible early on in the process to address any concerns. So this list is by no means exhaustive. These are just some of the common barriers that have um, been highlighted, but hopefully by it being aware of them, we can work to break breaking down or prevent them in the first place. And again, there's more information about these types of barriers in the guidance. So to conclude, I just want to leave you with some of the key messages that came out of our discussion groups in developing this guidance. So first of all, it's important to emphasize that all research and design can benefit from the voice of disabled people. And um, so involvement should not be limited to projects that are disability focused only. Best practice denotes that disabled people should be involved as early as possible in the research process, including designing what and how to research. It's important to clearly communicate all roles and responsibilities er from the outset and um, in order to make sure that everyone is on the same page and to avoid misunderstandings and disappointments. And it's important to include a diversity of voices in any research project. So disabled people from all communities and groups should be given representation in research. So finally, I just want to express a very sincere thank you to uh, our project advisory group and to everyone who gave their time and expertise to contribute to the development of this guidance. I would also like to thank the PPI Ignite Network for allowing us to be a part of the PPI Ignite Festival this year. And I want to express a very warm welcome and thank you to our guest speakers today who are going to share their perspectives of being involved in collaborative approaches to research.
So thank you very much for your attention today. The new guidance is now available on the NDA website and I encourage everyone to check it out. I'll now pass over to my colleague Jane who will introduce our first guest speaker. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was really, really interesting. Um, now, um, I'd like to move on to the next bit of our webinar. And this is about um, people talking from their personal experience of being involved in the research process. Um, our first panelist is Anya Wellard. Um, Anya graduated from Trinity College Dublin in the mid 80s with degrees in psychology and sociology. She then completed a postgrad diploma in counselling psychology and um, then worked as a counsellor in veterinary medicine, dealing with problems related to pet ownership and started a master's in research methods in UCD. Um, Ani didn't complete this due to a lack of proper facilities being in place at the time. Um, Anya has also recently been involved in a number of disability related projects. Um, but has been disappointed in some aspects. Uh, she continues to hope for change. And just to let you know, Anya uh, will have her camera turned off for this session. So Anya, are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Anya. Hello? I could, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, but you went down for a while there. So oh, I'm terribly sorry sure. about that. I, okay. I heard you say, I I had been a, a, a counsellor in veterinary medicine and then the whole thing went dead. OK, well, I, I suppose I, I, I've i updated everybody on your bio. <laughs> so I'll, 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 uh, I'll let you take it away there. Um, OK, super. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my short presentation, I hope, on collaborative research guidance in which I had the pleasure to participate in the experience firsthand of a collaborative research process. I was delighted to participate in the advisory group for developing the research guidance because it provides an opportunity for disabled people to collaborate in producing these guidelines, which will hopefully, and I emphasize hopefully, I'll come back to that in a minute, influence government policy um, government policy makers and also perhaps help with um, design of technology um, and uh, perhaps goods, uh, design of goods that are sold in shops. Um, I, I think that collaborative research has a lot of potential if it is adopted. Um, I really felt in this process, uh, unusually, because I've been involved in a number of, of different projects, but I really felt in this process that my input as an individual was valued. Um, I was asked to um, provide personal perspectives on this, so um, I, I, th this is a very, very personal perspective. Um, what I have learned through the process is that collaborative research is different to the more common um or the co collaborative research in which i was involved is is more um is different to the more common consultative processes which aiding mentioned there and which i have participated in and my experience has been um that uh I became increasingly disillusioned. Um, I participated in a number of consultative processes in the HSE um, in which they mainly appear to be cosmetic processes. Um, the, the process in which I was involved differs from the consultative processes in that instead of attending meeting after meeting, with powerless middle ranking office administrators, potentially there is an op op a real opportunity to engage with those who have the skills and the knowledge to bring about the actual changes that are needed. Collaborative research with disabled people 
involves the sharing of ideas, opinions, and experiences from my experience, uh, which in itself contributed contributes to the research findings. As I say, I've been involved in several consultative processes um, with the HSE involving the recruitment of disabled people. Notes were taken, minutes were, pro uh, minutes were provided, cataloging the issues that were raised. The consultative process ended and so too did any intentions by the administrators of that process to do anything to bring about any change. Collaborative research, the higher ranks of collaborative research, I think changes the role of the disabled participant from a passive information giver to that of an active advocate which the consultative process in my experience does not allow. And for me, the question underpinning um, the collaborative process is of course, will it actually lead to change? Collaborative research has the potential to bring about change if disabled people are involved in the early stages of development whether that is policy development, product design, web development, university research, all the research changes that influence infrastructure. Uh, a lot of that is going on at the moment. But the question is, will it actually be adopted and how do we ensure that this methodology is adopted? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, that was really, really insightful. Um, you know, and I'm, it just really, to outline the difference that involvement makes in the research process. Um, I think, you know, it can be a little bit difficult when we're waiting for change to happen because, you know, it, it, it's not immediate. So we, we nearly have to act and then, you know, wait and see, you know, but I think with, with strong, consistent involvement, um, of disabled people in research, you know, that's where we're going and that's what we want to happen. And I suppose that's where the NDA was coming from with these guidelines. Um, so thank you very much for that, Anya. Um, our next speaker is Fionn Crombie Angus. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about Fionn, um, Fionn is the Global Liaison for the Inclusive Research Network of Ireland and the inaugural chair of the Inclusive Research Special Interest Group, the International Association for the Scientific Study of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, he is the co-author of four peer-reviewed journal articles with a fifth in pre-publication. He has delivered papers at over a dozen international academic symposia. Um, so Fionn, if you'd like to take it away. Yes, uh, first of all, can you hear me all right? I can hear you loud and clear, Fionn. I can indeed. Great. Hello, my name is Fionn and I run a social enterprise with my father, whose name is Jonathan. We call it Fionnathan Productions. You might have seen me recently on TV ads promoting the government's new decision support service. Education and research are two of our social enterprises cornerstones and though I never enrolled in one, I have guest lectured at 30 universities in Ireland 
and around the world. Nothing about us without us is a motto that orients us towards collaborative research as the way of the future. When I was 18 years old, I had one option for for university attendance in Ireland, a segregated program without access to the wide variety of subjects others on campus would be studying. I am a firm believer in inclusion. It benefits the potentially excluded as well as the potential excluders. So I said, no thank you. I I convinced the HSE to give me a, a direct payment to manage my own disability support and I used that support in part to begin my own research project. I, de- I decided I would seek people deep into their careers as professional musicians or directors of movies and TV, as well as actors, script writers, crew members, and producers. I, I also wanted to talk to people who were studying nature and helping to solve the problems being caused to the environment. But I didn't know what questions to ask such a diverse group of research participants. And then it hit me. The the one thing I really want to, to know from each person, what do you love about your life? Nine years later, I'm con- I'm continuing to ask. We, we've posted nearly 700 interviews online in, in, in over 20 countries. Because many of these are with celebrities, it, it's a popular series. Fionathan presents the Happiness Project has around 4 million views. Just think of the boost I could have offered to an early career academic who had partnered with me. And think of the fun, but no one asked and I didn't know how to reach out. People with living experience are are waiting to be involved to help design and carry out research and and to present the findings alongside professional researchers. But they'll have to to be shown how research works and why it is done the way the way it is. They'll have to understand their rights and responsibilities as researchers. They'll have to be com- to be compensated for for their time and efforts in some com- combination of of money recognition and future opportunities just like the rest of the research team and importantly 
the the full participation will have to, to be built into the 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 project st structure from day one, recognizing that disability inclusion comes comes with added costs and and we require more more time and flexibility and surprise um designing such projects benefits everyone I, I was thrilled to to be invited to act as consultant to this new guidance document. I hope it helps you to navigate this journey we're all on toward a more equitable world. Lastly, I have d just begun my work as a volunteer with, with the European Network on Independent Living here in Brussels. And I want to thank my colleagues for for providing me time to join you today. Thank you. Thank thank you so much, Fionn. That was um just give me a moment now and I'll start my video. Um, that was really, really interesting. I think you touched on a, a, a lot of core issues there um, with regards to co-research and the co-research project uh, and projects um, and all of the things that we have to bear in mind. And, you know, it was it was great to have yourself and Anya on the research advisory group to feed directly into it. Um, OK, so we're, we're looking we're looking OK for time. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, and this is uh, Dr. Emer Marcy. Um, Emer is a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Psychology and School of Medicine at the University of Galway. She completed her PhD in health psychology in 2018. Her research centres on the self-management of long-term conditions with a strong focus on public patient involvement. Now, just give me a moment, Emer, are you? Yeah, yeah, are you yeah, ready I'm, to take it away? Super. Yeah, thanks, Jade. I'm. I have some slides, so I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully, you'll be able to pin the interpreter. Well, why don't you try and uh, share the slides first, and then we'll make sure that everyone can see them before we kick off. Um, unfortunately, as I'm a panelist, I could see you too. Um, mm -hmm. so we'll just perhaps get confirmation, um, from the audience that. They can see yourself and the Irish language, language interpreter. Um, There's a message there from John Bosco in the chat to say he can still see the interpreter. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to I'm going to mute myself and touch nothing now <laughs> for yeah. the rest of your presentation, and I'll catch you at the end. Great. Thank you, Jane. Um. So, hello, everybody, and um, thank you to the NDA for inviting me to contribute to this panel. And a special thank you to Anya and Fionn for their talks. Um, they were both really interesting and lots of important points in both. Uh, so my name is Emer, and I'm going to be talking about public and patient involvement or collaborative research um, from the perspective of a researcher. OK, so just a bit of background about me. Um, as you've heard, I work at the University of Galway and my background is in health psychology. I do research with people who are living with long term conditions, so things like diabetes. And it's usually about what it's like to manage a long term condition every day and how our healthcare services could be improved to meet people's needs. So I've been working in research for nearly 10 years now. And for the past five years, I've been working with PPI contributors or public and patient involvement contributors in lots of different projects. So today I'm going to talk about one of these projects in particular to illustrate how PPI has guided and improved our research and shaped my own perspective of PPI. The project is called D1 Now and it aims to improve outcomes for young adults with type 1 diabetes. So some of you might be familiar with type 1 diabetes already. Um, it's an autoimmune condition where the body doesn't produce insulin. 
um, which means that um, if you do have type 1 diabetes, you have an intensive self-management regime every day, which includes testing your blood sugars and administering insulin. So it can be quite difficult to balance diabetes management with the demands of everyday life. And this is particularly true for young people who are trying to juggle diabetes management with changes such as gaining independence, moving out of home, starting work or college, using alcohol and transitioning from pediatric to adult services. So what we see in research and in practice is that young people are at a much higher risk of poor complications than younger and older people with diabetes and also have high levels of diabetes related to stress. So some research has been done already into developing new interventions to improve outcomes for young adults with type 1 diabetes, but the results are inconclusive. And why? So why don't the current interventions work? And it's because they're designed by healthcare workers who are experts in anatomy and physiology and medicine and academic researchers like me who are experts in theories and models and research. But we're missing one big group of experts and that's our experts by experience. So people who are living with a condition have far more expertise in the lived and day-to-day -day experience than anybody who studies the condition. And the insight of these experts is the crucial missing component when designing um, new interventions or new research. So work on D1Now began in 2014, where we invited young adults with diabetes to join a young adult panel, or YAP for short, and work with the research team. And this was very much inspired by the work of the youth mental health charity Jigsaw, who have a youth advisory panel embedded in their service. And Jigsaw in Galway gives a lot of support when we were setting up our panel. So eight young adults initially became involved in the young adult panel, and these are pictures from some of the first meetings. If you're interested in learning more about the process of setting up a group like this, we published a paper about it, which includes the young adults themselves as co-authors, and that's the, the paper there. So as I mentioned, um, the young adult panel initially had eight members, and then as time passed, some members were ready to move after giving significant contributions to the project, and we carried out two rounds of refreshment, where we invited new members in 2017 and 2019. Um, at this stage, over 20 young adults have been part of the Young Adult Panel, and we currently have eight members from all around Ireland. And we've just received some funding to move our research to the next phase, so we hope to develop a new Young Adult Panel in early 2024, with our senior members acting as mentors to the new members. Um, so this is just a picture of one of our meetings. A lot of our meetings are on Zoom now these days. Um, when our research is active, we usually have meetings every month. Um, they last between an hour or two. We've contact in between meetings if needed via our WhatsApp group or email, and we have a shared Google Drive folder where we can work on documents together. Um, the young adult panels, panel members are really embedded in the governance of the project. Um, so they're at, kind of in, at, at each group, and we have a YAP member on the steering group for our project, which is kind of the highest level of governance. So I'm just going to give um, an example of how they have guided and shaped um, the research that we've conducted. So back to the our initial research uh, problem around healthcare services not meeting the needs of young people with type 1 diabetes. So through the research we did, we looked at the literature and evidence that was out there, and we also um, talked to our young adult panel about it, and we identified some gaps in the current diabetes service. It seemed that young adults had a poor relationship with the diabetes clinic because they met a different doctor every time they went, and then they had to tell their story every time, and they didn't feel like they had that kind of continuity of care. And they also didn't feel like they had support outside of clinic appointments. So we developed two new components that could be introduced to the clinic team to improve this. So an agenda setting tool and a support worker. An agenda setting tool, it's um, it's pretty simple. It's just a sheet of paper with some questions on it that a young person would fill in before their appointment, usually in the waiting room. It asks questions like, what do you want to talk about in your clinic appointment today? And then a support worker is somebody who the young adult would meet at every clinic appointment check in with them and would also be an accessible point of contact outside of clinic appointments. So when we started off, we only had a rough draft of what each of these might look like. So we needed to refine them through qualitative research, which means um, talking to people. So going out and doing interviews and focus groups. Um, so because we were going to do qualitative research, the Young Adult Panel um, did training in qualitative research. Um, and then after that, they could have one of the following roles in data collection. They could coordinate the focus group logistics, they could coordinate the field notes, they could um, facilitate the debrief, 
or they could co-facilitate the focus group with the research team. And it was up to each uh, YAP member which role they wanted to take on, if any. And this is a picture of everybody looking very happy to learn about research methods. So to refine the agenda setting tool and support worker, we conducted interviews and focus groups with young adults and with healthcare workers. Our YAP members took part in the data collection by acting as focus group note takers and moderators. And then they also played a crucial role in the analysis of the data. Um, so we went through every transcript from the interviews and focus groups and any aspect of the data that identified a barrier or made a suggestion for possible improvement was tabulated. And then we brought all these to the app um, and a modification to them was implemented if it was deemed acceptable and useful by YAP members. So this was our first draft of the agenda setting tool. It was long and parts of it were difficult to understand. And then this is the refined version. So the app decided which bits were unnecessary and could be cut out. And they also rephrased some of the language that was used. Um, with the support worker, we weren't really sure exactly what background they should have. Should they be a diabetes nurse or maybe an occupational therapist? We also weren't sure of exactly what their duties would be apart from being a consistent point of contact for the young adults. And this is the refined version. I don't have time to get into all the points now, but we were able to really expand on the duties and qualifications required. Um, and you can see there we were able to um, open it up to a wide variety of different backgrounds. So then we actually went ahead and hired a support worker in 2019 and the job spec was drawn up by the research team and young adult panel together uh, based on our research. And a member of the young adult panel sat on the um, interview panel with us. And our hired support worker was an occupational therapist with a background in youth mental health. So she was really perfect for the role. Um, so that's just a very brief flavor of the kind of contribution the Young Adult Panel have given to the D1 Now project. Um, they've been involved in a lot more. I really don't have time to get into everything they've been involved in, but they have been authors on papers. They've spoken at so many conferences, both national and international conferences. They've given seminars and webinars with us and by themselves. Um, they've been co-applicants on two successful funding applications now. And a, a really um, generous thing that, that they do is that they often give guidance to other PPI groups as well, um, because I suppose they've been around for 10 years now. Um, so they often kind of um, are, are mentors to other PPI groups. So you can read more about the project um, and our work on our website, which is d1now.ie. Um, we were also featured in a documentary called The Patient Effect. Um, so if you get a chance to see that at any stage, our work is involved in it, is, is featured in it. And also uh, led by Professor Sean Deneen, who is the PI in this work, we've recently been successful for get, in getting funding for a bigger study. So, so watch this space. And now um, just moving on to some of my own reflections as a researcher um, working with PPI contributors. First of all, I would like to mention some very recent research that was conducted by Anne Roddy for her master's thesis at the University of Galway. Anne was interested in the perspective of Irish researchers on PPI in health and social care research. She conducted interviews with 11 researchers at different career stages, and she identified several benefits and challenges associated with PPI for researchers. The challenges included things like having proper resourcing for PPI, so having enough time built into the project and also having payment, a budget for that. Um, the emotional labour that's often involved in running a PPI group and challenges with creating and maintaining a panel. So things like logistics and communications and trying to ensure diversity and equality in the group. Um, the benefits then include things like improved research outputs, uh, professional and personal well-being. So the researchers she spoke to often mentioned having increased motivation, empathy and understanding and increased skills in facilitation, advocacy and communication. And presented this work as part of the PPI Festival last week. And I put up her email address here in case anybody wants to learn more about the work. And Anne's findings are very much reflective of my own experience of PPI. I really feel like I've become a better researcher in the last five years uh, compared to the five years before that where I wasn't engaging in PPI. My, re my research now feels more relevant and impactful and I've developed a much better understanding of the conditions I research. I never would have gotten that from just reading the literature. Um, I've learned that good PPI takes significant time and resourcing, and it's really important that that's factored into project timelines and budgets. It will take more time than you expect, so it's important that you do factor that in. 
It's great to see now the PPI is mandated in some grants applications, but it's crucial that it doesn't result in um, kind of tokenistic or box ticking exercise. I, exercises, this kind of work does need to be really meaningful and really inclusive. It's important to note as well that this work is not one size fits all. I suppose a, a, a panel suited that particular uh, project that I spoke about there, but a panel isn't always what suits a project. There are different ways of including people and involving different people, and we need to always be working to ensure that we're as inclusive as possible. Um, so thank you everybody for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion and just if there are any researchers out there who are interested in learning more about PPI, there's really great resources on the PPI Ignite Network and I've put the website up there, it's just ppinetwork.ie. Super, thank you so much Emer. that was um, a really, really interesting sort of practical how to, you know, we're, we're, we're all on the page in, in relation to, to PPI and, and co-research, but, you know, with everything else, it, it, it can sometimes fall down with the how <laughs> precisely. Uh, so good to get really great example there of how it, how it works. Thank you so much. Um, we are somehow um, on time. Uh, we're running to schedule. So we're going to have time for a good Q&A session. Um, I'm just going to give um, our administrator a little bit of time to spotlight all of the speakers. Um, so if everyone, if you have a camera, turn it on, uh, please. And um, if you don't, feel free to leave it off. Um, so, OK, I think that's everybody. So to the audience, if they have any questions, please put them in to the comment box um, and we will we'll be able to pose them uh to our panel here um Emer, we had a uh just i suppose a comment in not a question and it was is the d1 initiative going to be rolled out in the rest of ireland slash more locations and she just says great work so do you want to get the ball rolling with that question while we wait yeah. for some more to come in yeah, and um, thank you for that lovely comment. Uh, yeah, so we've recently gotten funding to run um, a full scale randomized control trial. And um, so we will be involving 12 diabetes centers in that. And that will give us um, a bit more information about whether um, our new approach to diabetes care um, is effective or not. I mean, I think it probably is. Um, but yeah, we need to do that research to find out for sure. And as I mentioned um, in the in the presentation, our young adult panel are going to continue to be very embedded in the work. And the young adults who we are working with currently are going to act as mentors to a new and younger young adult panel. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I have a question here. I think it will possibly be for Chloe. Um, so it's, do the guidelines include children with disabilities? Thanks, Jane. Um, and thank you to all the speakers as well. Really interesting um, perspectives. So thank you very much. Um, so the guidance that the NDA developed are more focused on including adults um, with, with disabilities. Um, some, of, some of it would certainly apply to also working with children, but they're not specifically aimed at children. We felt that maybe um, that would warrant separate guidance. But that was part of the reason as well why we wanted to invite Emer on, because um, we knew she'd be bringing on kind of younger people's perspectives as well, which is really important. OK, super. Thanks so much. Um, I think some of the audience are are getting some questions together. Um, and I suppose, you know, I have a question if that's if that's okay. Um, it, one of the sort of recurring themes across all of the, the presentations was, you know, um, building in extra time for co research approaches. And I suppose, as researchers, we know that you know, you build that in at the start. You know, you can you can make plans for it. But I just wanted to ask. Uh, firstly, Fionn, his thoughts on how it impacts him as a co-researcher, and then I'll come and ask the same question to Anya. So just get your perspective on it. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, I I like being a, a, a researcher, but also being a co-researcher too. But mm -hmm. do you want to play but just to say that it that it does take more time when a project involves people. Do you want to talk about the inclusive research network work? Uh yeah, so so I'm so I'm the the global the liaison for the IRN 
um and 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 I give them the liaison updates on 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 what has happened and then what will happen in the future as well. Mm -hmm. And hi, I'm Jonathan Fionn's dad know. and supporter uh, yeah. and, and colleague. Yes, right? exactly. And, yeah. and so the Inclusive Research Network of Ireland is one of these that with the pyramid, Chloe, that you showed, it would be in that top level um, where really it's the people with intellectual disability yeah. who are determining what the research will be. Yes. And, yes. Um, and, and then working with professional researchers yeah. on choosing the right research methods and how to write it up for, for um, uh, inclusion into academic um, records, yeah. academic publishing. So things go very slowly, Yeah. right? I'd say yes, you, yes. you do a, a big project every couple of years. So I think that's a real um, yeah. key thing for people to consider that yeah. um, maybe the more involvement you have mm. or the more leadership from yeah. people who are not traditional researchers, mm. the more time yeah. it all takes. Yes, yeah. Okay, super. Thanks so much. I'll just go very quickly to Anya. Um, would you mind giving us your, your thoughts on, you know, how being involved in research impacts your time? Um, yes, it does. And um, I, I suppose there's, there's two ways of approaching this. And uh, Fiona um, touched on this um, in, in his presentation. And that is you know, certainly that the processes I've been involved in, the consultative processes I've been involved in, I feel that my time was not actually valued probably because we weren't paid. I suspect we would have been treated with a bit more respect um, if, if we had been paid for the uh, three, four hours <laughs> that um, we were required um, to participate. So I suppose that's, that, that's, that's one, one angle. The mm -hmm. other angle is that if I had to put in the time and I was properly respected and valued for it, um, as I felt I was, I have to say, participating in the um, advisory project. And I'm not just saying that because you're all there. Um, I really did have a different experience. Um, and I, I, I would be prepared to put in that extra time if I thought it was going to lead to genuine change. But I think that possibly that genuine change isn't going to be there until 2025 when the European um, laws come in. Okay, thank you very much, Anya. That, that sort of leads me leads me uh, to my next question, um, and closely related to time is the issue of payment. Uh, so the question is, should we pay all co-researchers? Um, and if so, on what basis should that be calculated? Um, so I might go to Emer first um, to quickly, if you don't mind, answer that yeah, for me. Fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, we pay all our core researchers. So I suppose our thinking is, you know, if you brought a statistician to the project, you wouldn't expect them to work for free. Um, so why would you expect um your experts by lived experience to work for free. So I think a key thing when you are starting a project like this is to have a terms of reference. Um, so exactly what's expected of the contributor, but also what could be expected of the research team and also payment as part of that. Um, and make that as clear and transparent as possible from the outset. Okay, super. Fionn, do you have anything to add there on the issue of payment? Oh uh, yeah, <clears throat> they'll, they'll have to be they have to be compensated for 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 their time and efforts in in, in some combination of money recognition and future opportunities just like the rest of the research team yeah so you so you're repeating that, that line from your um statement earlier yes um and it's just to, to be aware of of course a lot of people who create research are not being paid cash for the research but those are usually 
young career professionals and they they put in the effort understanding that there's other forms of compensation and also with people with with um, disability in Ireland uh, it can be a problem to receive a couple hundred euro one week and then the revenue people say oh it looks like you've received this money and then the social welfare people say we're going to cut your disability allowance mm. by this month and they assume that you're just going to keep getting that amount yeah. of money every week and they never check back you know so um so mm. some people uh who are co-researchers yeah. avoid cash and there's this whole little trick which i question the idea of giving people um cards yeah uh, gift cards, cards. Yeah. but to we me that's cards, just another yeah. form of cash so i think we we have to look at the whole system if um if people who are non-professional researchers don't yeah. want to become professional researchers then they don't value having their name as a co-author as much as yeah. people who are on a career path but i think it can be an incentive yeah. for some people yes okay okay thanks very much just to bring Oni in there um Oni, do you have any thoughts on on payment um, um, yes, I, I, um, I, on blind welfare allowance, on disability allowance, on, I think, invalidity allowance, you are entitled to earn so much a week. Um, so, you know, if all, uh, it, it, the, the payment could be negotiated with, you know, if somebody is on social well, not every disabled person is on social welfare allowance, a huge number of people are. Um, and certainly the payments could be made within those limits or they could be negotiated. Yeah. I don't think it will provide a problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we might have time for one more. Um, before we finish off the session uh, and there was one question in there about where to find people um, who um, you want to engage in collaborative research or PPI so Emer, I might come to you first on that and give your experience on, on you know where do you find people um, to take part yeah, and I suppose a, a trap we can kind of fall into easily as researchers is kind of just go down the easy route and maybe um, you know invite people who've been involved in research before or use our own networks you really have to you know be doing a bit more than that and and, and go out to where the people actually are um so we would have gone out to the diabetes clinics but we also would have um advertised and invite people through social media so um there's particular hashtags the diabetes community use or um there's a facebook group as well um and then I'm just thinking of another project I'm involved in with, uh, with older people. Um, we went out to an active retirement group. You know, it's about getting out into the community um, and finding people where they're at rather than waiting for them to come to you. Well, yeah, yeah. Don't be shy, essentially. <laughs> Could I just add uh, one more thing to that? Yes, of course, well? Chloe. On the PPI Night Network website, you can actually advertise um, your opportunities as well. So if you have a project or you want to recruit people, there is... Um, sort of a notice board on the PPI Ignite network and you can put up um, that you're looking for people there and um, so that can be another way to to try and reach a wide group. Okay um, and I suppose um, Fionn do you want to give us your perspective um, on, on how people can can where people can find contributors? Uh, uh, yes the the inclusive the inclusive research network of Ireland and 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 the independent living movement of Ireland as well. Two good sources for people. Yeah. Some of whom have experience with research. Yes. Others who would be really uh, uh, would have wonderful stories and not so wonderful stories that right. should be included. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And just finally, then to come to Anya, do you have any sort of any perspectives on? I suppose I would add to that the DPOs, the Disabled Pe um, Persons Organisations. That's how I came to be involved, actually. It was from an email sent to Voice of Vision Impairment from the NDA. Um, but I agree, as a target group, uh, disabled people are quite difficult um, to find. Um, I was involved in another uh, project with the NDA where the actual... Um, 
it, I suppose, terms of the research were changed because it was going to be difficult to actually find um, disabled people, not because they didn't exist, but, um, you know, there's no, uh, thank God, in some ways, there's there's no register. <laughs> um, I yeah. suppose going to the various organisations, unfortunately, um, like the Irish Wheelchair Association, the National Council for the Blind, as I say, the various DPOs um, and uh, social media and perhaps radio interviews um, as well. Um, you know, getting radio interviews on places like um, Claire Byrne show, um, Drive Time, Morning Ireland, um, to which a lot of people would, would listen um um about projects that are going on um might be another way to okay just to just to link in with people um because i suppose it works there's there's two sort of parts there's people who want to be involved in research and there's researchers who want people to be involved and it's it's about suppose, connecting the two um we have just gone over our time here we were due to finish at one o'clock so i'm going to wrap up proceedings thank you firstly to uh, all of our speakers you freed up the time to come along today it was it was really interesting it was really informative and um, you know we're really really grateful that you were able to come along and, and talk to us today um, I'd like to thank PPI um, Ignite for including us in our in their wonderful festival. Um, if you, you know, have the time, perhaps maybe see what other events are on. There may be other events on that might be of interest to you. And uh, lastly, thank you to everyone who came today. And um, there were some questions in the Q&A that I didn't unfortunately have time to get to. Um, so thank you for your patience and uh, thank you for your patience at the start um, and just to say thank you everybody for coming along today. Thank you. And thank you. You're very welcome, Fionn. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And best of luck with uh, with Eno. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful experience for you. Yes, thank you. Bye. Super. Thank you. Bye. Well, I'm not the anchor, so I'd like to meet him.